Yeah, we can start. Deepsha, please. Good evening and welcome everyone to DAE CV Raman Lecture 2022. My name is Deepsha Das. I am a PG1 student studying at Presidency University, Kolkata. I would kindly request Professor Aravindan Nayak to give his welcome address for the session. Over to you, Ayan, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I heartily welcome one and two all present here to the DAE Shivi Raman Lecture this year, uh, jointly organized by the uh, Department of Physics, Presidency University, and Indian Physics Association on digital uh, platform. So, uh, you know, nowadays uh, 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 we feel comfortable uh, on the digital platform and uh, possibly our nation will face a digital university very shortly. So anyway, I would like to extend a warm welcome to the chair of today's lecture, Professor Samit Kumar Roy, uh, Professor of Physics, uh, IIT Kharagpur, and uh, former director of uh, SN Bosch National Center for Basic Sciences, Kolkata. Uh, we are indeed uh, grateful for your uh, gracious presence, sir. I feel uh, grateful to welcome our distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Arindam Ghosh, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Professor Ghosh is a recipient of uh, Santi Sharu Bhadnagar Prize and prestigious in uh, Infosys Prize for Physical Sciences and many more. And uh, he is uh, well known for his experimental work uh, on the electronic uh, transport property in nanoscale system. So uh, the topic uh, for today's lecture is boon and pain of knowledge in emerging materials and technology. Uh, this is basically a benefit and affliction of knowledge in device uh, physics. Indeed, uh, gener uh, generation of knowledge and its impact uh, is a fascinating subject in various branches of physics. In electronic materials and devices, it is undesired, but throws a new light in some cases. For example, uh, the appearance of electrical knowledge in devices based on 2D graphene materials, but this is a wonder, uh, wonderful materials, inspired us not only to study the electronic structure at the metal graphene junction, but also leads to discover low noise devices. This is uh, graphene electronics. So uh, uh, we learn many interesting phenomena of noise in device says uh, based on emerging, the emerging materials uh, today from Professor Bush. And uh, uh, I'm also thankful to uh, uh, Dr. Vandana uh, Naral and uh, Professor uh, Tunusi Sahadas Gupto, uh, the Vice President of the Indian Physics Association. And uh, 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 once again, I welcome you all and also take the opportunity to thank you all for joining with us. Hope you uh, enjoy yourselves. So thank you. Thank you, sir, for the warm and delightful welcome address. Now I will kindly request Professor Tanushri Shah Dajgupta to speak about the session. Thank you, uh, Deepsha. So it's now my pleasant duty to tell you a bit 
about the activities of Indian Physics Association, which is one of the organizers of this seminar. So let me just uh, share the screen. I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Yes. Okay. So Indian Physics Association, which was founded in the year 1970, with a goal to have a platform for the Indian physicists to meet at one place, exchange their ideas, develop collaboration. So like many other physics associations all across the world, the purpose is to have a kind of networking among the physicists. And this is the homepage uh, that you can have a look. We do have our presence in the social media, in the YouTube, as well as in the Facebook and Twitter. So basically the Indian Physics Association has currently 47 chapters and you can see the chapters are kind of distributed at different parts of India. Uh, being uh, geographically as diverse as possible. And with uh, 4,400 members, the primary activities are organizing special lectures, one, one of them being organized today, liaising with the national bodies, uh, biennial awards, international linkage program, especially in terms of connecting with other physical societies of the world, like American Physical Society, IOP of UK, SIF, and it's also a member of uh, AAPPS. And uh, it has, of course, uh, endorsed the global effort on the role of physics in green economy, which is a statement uh, which is done on the behalf of all the physics uh, societies of the different parts of the world. And the membership form is available on our website. I know there are many young listeners in the audience. So if you are still not the member of Indian Physics Association, it is a time to get yourself enrolled for the membership. And Indian Physics Association, apart from organizing various different scientific events, one of its uh, activities is in publication. So there are publications like Physics News, the IPA Bulletin, and it's published quarterly. And again, the website address is given. And these are basically some kind of representative cover pages of different publications of uh, the Physics News. The Physics News also has started a section on Meet the Physicists, and where we try to highlight basically the young physicists so this is also a good opportunity for the student to get yourself known, having your presence in this Meet the Physicist Corner. And also we have started in the Physics News where different uh, institutes of India uh, working in the domain of physics is being highlighted. And if you are interested, you can also contribute by sending an article about your own institute by sending, uh, this is the email address, and you can contribute uh, in a significant way, especially the young people uh, in terms of uh, uh, strengthening this journal of this physics association. And uh, <clears throat> this is the current uh, composition of the executive council. Professor uh, S. Ramakrishnan, director of uh, TIFR, is currently the president of Indian Physics Association. I am the vice president of Indian Physics Association. Professor Bandana Nannal, who is in the audience, she is the general secretary. Uh, Professor Shomit Mandal, who is a joint secretary, and Dr. Aradhana Srivastava is the treasurer. And apart from the activities in scientific domain uh, within the Indian Physics Association, uh, also a, a sub committee has been set up to look at the issue of gender in physics working group. And this is the composition, present composition of the group. And this is a platform to address various issues 
related to gender parity in physics profession. And <clears throat> this subcommittee has been uh, greatly uh, active in organizing different events and one of the most notable one being pressing for progress 2019. And if you really want to know more about it, you can visit the homepage of IPA. And uh, I will end my short introduction uh, saying a few words about the lecture series of DE CV Raman lecture series. This lecture series was initiated in the year 1989 by Indian Physics Association with a grant from the Department of Atomic Energy. And that gives the name as DAE, as you can see. And initially these were given to the undergraduate student uh, and in science and professional colleagues in the <coughs> limit of the greater Bombay. So it was really concentrated, mostly Bombay centric. <coughs> on the topics in nuclear science and their application. But as you can see over the time, <coughs> it has expanded its scope both in terms of the topic. So it has extended beyond the nuclear physics. Also, it has extended beyond the area of the greater Bombay. <coughs> and taking the advantage of the present day, the pandemic, like any other coin has its both sides up and down, the upside being it has given us this unique opportunity of this online platform. And taking advantage of this, you can see now the <coughs> CVD, CVD Raman lecture series, some of the past two talks I have put here. And they are given from people of different region, like somebody from NCRA, uh, Professor Chengulkar, is giving a talk in Gaya and <laughs> Gautam Bhattacharya from SNP is giving the talk in Jatni. And today we have a speaker from Bangalore who is giving the talk in Kolkata. So pandemic has done some good thing, admitting that it has done tremendous uh, also suffering and damages, but that's anything that comes up with both positive and negative. So with that, I, I end my brief introduction. And I do hope that many of the young people in this audience will be interested to getting enrolled uh, as a member of Indian Physics Association. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for your exceptional and informative words. I would like to invite Dr. Atunur Rajak to introduce today's chairperson of the session. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Deepsa. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. So welcome to all in DA CV Ramon lecture session. So let me introduce Professor uh, Sumit Kumar Rai from Department of Physics of IIT Kharagpur. And he is also former director of SNBOS National Center for Basic Science, Kolkata. Uh, Professor Rai is a well known experimentalist uh, working on semiconducting material systems, nanostructure systems. Uh, and uh, we are very happy that he has kindly agreed uh, to chair the session. And uh, we are eagerly waiting to hear Professor Orindo Mukhos uh, from ISC. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and over to Professor Roy. Nanostructure systems. Yeah, thank you, everyone. So it's really my pleasure to chair today's session on that uh, D. Sibiramon lecture of 2022, jointly organized by IPA and the Patients University. I really congratulate Patients University for hosting this lecture. And today we have, I have the pleasant duty to, um, I mean, to, uh, to uh, introduce the today's distinguished speaker, Professor Arindam Ghosh from IIC Bangalore. He's very well known to the, not only to the condensed matter physics community, overall physics community, but particularly to the experimental condensed matter physics. So it will not be more if I say he's the leader in the experimental condensed matter physics in India today. So he's very, very young and doing, uh, excellent work and already made a significant contribution through his a short academic career as a faculty member at ISC Bangalore. 
So after graduating from Calcutta University in 1991, uh, he moved to IIC Bangalore for doing his master's and PhD. And after that, he was at Cambridge University UK for five years for his postdoctoral fellowship and joined the IIC Bangalore faculty in 2011. So currently he's a professor at the Department of Physics there. And during his tenure at IIC, he also visited many, uh, many places in the abroad, including that IBM TJ Watson Research Center at IBM, New York in May 2019, in, in 2009. So Professor Ghosh has received a lot of laurels and awards. Uh, it will be very difficult for me to name all of them, but uh, just to name a few, which are the most prestigious is the Sanpi Sharab Bhatnagar Prize in 2012, as well as the, the, uh, the Infosys Prize for Physical Sciences the, one of the most prestigious award that recognized achievements in science and research in India. In addition, he has received BM Billa Science Foundation Prize, DE Rajaramanna Prize Lecture in Physics, Oxford Instrument Young Nano Scientist Award. And of course, he's, uh, he, uh, he was elected fellows of all the national academies of India. So his current research interest, uh, he works on a wide variety of topics, Professor Ghosh, I know. Uh, he's our younger friend. So his current research interest is on broadly on transport properties of two-dimensional electronic systems. In fact, he's one of the first pioneer to start the so-called the transport properties of graphene in India, at least, or two D materials in India. Uh, then he's also working on carbon-based two-dimensional system, optoelectronic properties of atomically thin semiconductor membranes, magnetic nanostructures, structural stability of nanoscale systems. And nowadays he's also working a lot of I work on quantum materials, quantum uh, for the uh, for the quantum devices. So today's uh, lecture topic is very interesting and very very broad and uh, very interesting, particularly for the which will be able to motivate the young students to take up the research career in their future. This is the boon and bane of noise on emerging materials and technology. So we are all looking forward to an excellent uh, lecture by Professor Arindam Ghosh. So, Professor Ghosh, please. Thank you, Professor Rai. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, shall I share my screen now? Please. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Rai, for a very kind uh, introduction. I would like to thank uh, the IPA Vandana and uh, the organizers, Sujitana and others. Uh, it's really um, frustrating. I know Tanushri believes that, you know, that there is a good thing about, you know, being stuck at one place and, and still uh, get lectures from all over the country. But at the same time, it would have been really nice to be at President's University and interact with you in person. Um, but I hope that that's going to happen at some point of time in the future. Um, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit different topic, which is noise, which uh, we have been doing for a very long time. In fact, my PhD uh, was on noise measurements, and uh, then uh, I started when I started as a faculty member in IIC. I took this up as my initial project um, to enter the professional career in in physics in India well, globally as well. So uh, I'm going to go in a way in which I hope there would be something for everybody to, to uh, appreciate, in, including people who are at the initial level of their physics course, as well as people who are at an advanced level. Uh, I'm hoping that you know, there will be sufficient time for an interaction if there, is, if there are questions at the end. So um, you cannot get real peace without keeping quiet. Uh, this is something which is more referring to noise pollution, but uh, for people like us who measure um, noise, we believe that it's not the case. Uh, you can get real peace without keeping quiet, provided those come from the samples that you measure. Okay, uh, so obviously noise has a very, very uh, diverse opinion uh, from different people. To most physicists, uh, it's a subject of fluctuation appears as pointless, spontaneous fluctuations, and no one wants it, okay? And they believe it's only uh, uh, given by unwise experimenters. So in which, in that case, we are, we have been very unwise for the last 15 years. 
Uh, but I will try and convince you that it's not necessarily uh, unwise to measure noise. Okay, so why noise is so important? And, and this was one of the articles by Carlo Benecker way back in 2003. Turns out that, uh, you know, the noise does carry unique signatures of fundamental processes in condensed matter. Uh, and its information content is well beyond the standard conductance measurement. And that's very important. Most electrical uh, properties or even non-electrical properties which measure linear uh, you know, response of the system, um, it usually provides certain average uh, information, but the noise in those physical properties start giving you a complementary information, which is beyond that given by the average property measurements. And that's what I'm going to uh, try and talk about. Okay, so what are the typical noises? And this is something which is uh, meant for people who are at the initial uh, levels of their uh, physics understanding. Uh, first is a thermal noise. A thermal noise is, uh, you know, it's an agitation of charge carriers, mostly electrons. Uh, in a conductor. And that's because electrons are continuously moving around uh, randomly because there's a thermal uh, fluctuations, right? Because it's a finite temperature and there's always a very large, uh, as, uh, because electrons move around, you, you, if you measure the voltage across uh, this sample, you will measure um, noise and that's called thermal noise. Uh, in addition, there's something called a short noise and it is it originates from a discrete nature of charge because if you pass a current in a solid, uh, a current is carried by electrons and the electrons are discrete particles. So they move randomly from one end of the sample to the other and that gives you noise in uh, the voltage or the current that you measure and that's called short noise. There are noise like phase noise as well, which is some form of a um, radio frequency noise. Whenever you apply, you know, you're working at a radio frequency regime, then the phase of the uh, excitation can, can, can slip. It can uh, give you a jitter and that leads to some sort of noise in the radio frequency regime called a phase noise. Okay. Um, the noise that we will be mostly talking about today is called the flicker noise or one of our, one of our F noise, okay? It is there in all electronic components. If you have any system with, which carries electricity, it will have one of our F noise, okay? It, one of our F noise, by the way, is very interesting because it seems to be there in many, many completely diverse systems. For example, it is there in our heartbeat. The fluctuations in the frequency of our heartbeat is also having one of our F noise. It has um, uh, traffic control, sees the cars passing in an unit time, per unit time across a junction can be, is a fluctuating quantity and can have one over F noise. So one over F noise is extremely uh, broad and I don't think that any understanding of a unifying mechanism that connects all these diverse regimes is known. So we will not go into that at all, but we will look into the noise in a physical system, especially the in electrical transport uh, in a physical system and try and see uh, what gives noise and how we can make use of that noise, okay? So um, it, it can show up in variety of effects, but often it works as a resistance fluctuation. Suppose in an Ohm's law, you have a resistor and you pass a current in, in that, it's the noise that the fluctuations in the voltage that you, that you measure usually reflects fluctuation in its resistance. Okay. And that goes as one over F. And I'll tell you what is one over F in a minute. There are other noises as well. For example, avalanche noise, you have got diodes and you have, uh, you get a PN junction. And when you have the reverse bias avalanche breakdown, you get other type of noises called avalanche noises. Okay. But I'm going to be, um, talking about the flicker noise today. You see, if you take an electrical device, an electrical device can be an op amp, it can be a simple resistor, it can be nanoscale devices like a carbon nanotube, no matter what you take, if you look at the <clears throat> fluctuations in the resistance uh, in the, or, the, or, or current, when you pass uh, through them, it's usually shown as a function of frequency. Okay, this is the noise in voltage 
and this is frequency. And there are two parts that I would like you to take a look at. One part is this frequency, uh, low frequency part, which is called one over F regime, because the slope, this is a log log plot, the slope of this noise, this region is inversely proportional to F, F to the power of one or around one, and then there is this other part, which is a flat part, and this is called a broadband noise. And this part usually is dominated by the thermal noise and the short noise that I talked to you about. Okay, um, how does it look? This is how it looks. So this you can do even in your, in your undergraduate laboratory. If you have a, a good enough voltmeter, you can take this data from any resistor that you can find in your handy. You can see the time, in the order of second and the resistance continuously fluctuates if you can measure it properly. This resistance fluctuates above a certain mean. Okay? And if I want to know what is the noise magnitude, it usually is expressed in terms of what you call a power spectral density. The definition of power spectral density is very simple. You take this resistance, you can, by the way, you can measure resistance, you can measure current, you can measure voltage, you can measure conductance, anything measurable will fluctuate some in, in the manner that you can see here, okay? So if you take this auto two point correlation function, this is R at T equal to at T and R at T plus tau, where tau is a lag, you see that you, you, you define this correlation function and then it take a cosine Fourier transform of this correlation function is called the power spectral density. Essentially, it tells you from a particular frequency how much of it is present in the fluctuations that you see in time. Okay, so if I take this, then you, it usually looks something like this, that this white thing is the total noise that you measure that I showed in the previous graph. And this noise is called the one over F noise because it goes as one over F. And this noise is the sum of Johnson noise and short noise. The question that you can immediately ask me, okay, hang on, I have a voltmeter but really how small a voltage that we need to measure to give you know, this kind of noise. And that will depend very strongly on the sample or the system that you measure. For example, this is what is a typical level, level of noise that we need to measure in order to say that, okay, we are measuring one over F noise and the short noise and the Johnson noise. This is a typical example of a resistor, which is typically about 100, one to 100 uh, ohms, it shouldn't be, it's about one to hundred ohms. And you see that above that, there's a resistance fluctuations in the order of a micro ohm. okay? Typically that means that the delta R by R, which is the relative fluctuation with the resistance is typically can be about 10 power of minus six or seven to about 10 power of minus three. So that's the stability or the level of your measurement needs to be. So if you today use a current of approximately one microampere current and your fluctuations is in the order of this 10 microvolt, then you know that the kind of voltage fluctuations that your voltmeter needs to measure is in the order of picovolt in a, in a bandwidth of about one hertz or something of that sort. So you can see again, uh, if I take a current of one microampere current with a resistance of approximately thousand ohms, and we are talking about say room temperature, then this is one of our F noise, the black one. This level will be the Johnson noise, which is four kBT multiplied by R, the temperature multiplied by the resistance uh, of the resistor that you're measuring. And the short noise, which is two E multiplied by I is in this order of magnitude. Okay, so these are three different major components of noise that we usually measure in our laboratory. Now you can always ask the question, okay, so this is a small voltage. How do you really measure? So let me show you a picture. Many of the people uh, here have seen this picture. So this is typically how a noise measurement setup looks like, okay? Um, so you might want to say that, okay, this, there must be something, you know, very expensive. It's actually not so. So if you look at a typical measurement of noise, it is done with a lock-in amplifier, that's a lot of lack, which is what, uh, you know, uh, standard physics laboratory or uh, a, a experimental laboratory can afford. Uh, it's a temperature controller, which you need to vary temperatures about 
two to three lakhs uh, good temperature control. You need very good quality temperature controller because you need to make sure that the temperature is absolutely or as much as constant as possible within the order of say few millikelvins so that the fluctuation in resistance that you want to measure should not come from fluctuations in temperature. So that's very important to ensure. So you need a good quality temperature controller. Usually you need a computer approximately about a lakh or so with a data card, et cetera. And sometimes, uh, well, I mean, we do need a homemade cryostat uh, because uh, that's, you know, that's where you put your sample and usually use, use leads of that sample to take the electrical signals out and put feed into this temperature uh, amplifiers and, and controllers. And then sometimes it is optional, not always necessary, an electromagnetically shielded cage. Again, it can be purely home built system. So, so if you totally add this, it comes to approximately seven to eight lakhs or so. So if you have a laboratory with about seven to eight lakhs of rupees, uh, in principle, you will be able to do everything that I'm going to talk about today. Okay? It's about asking the right question and uh, see what kind of physics problems that you can address. Okay, so what is the origin of one over F noise? Okay, the kind of noise that I talked to you about needs the measurement of about a picovolt to a nanovolt or millivolt in that order of magnitude. Usually what happens is that it's, a, it's called a slow relaxation. So suppose you can see that if I have a defect in, in, in a solid like this, this is, this is a solid of that I need to measure. This is a, a, a defect. Okay, these are not electrons. This is a defect. Now defects always move around in a random fashion inside a solid because of, say, for example, finite temperature. Nothing is static in finite temperature. Now suppose that you have got just one defect, and that defect is moving between two positions, and that leads to what you call a two-state noise. The system is corresponding to one configuration of, of the defect is one state, and the conductance or the resistance of the system is in a different state when the defect moves to a different position. Now, if you have such two-state system, then you can take the autocorrelation function and you can do a Fourier transform and you get this Lorentzian power spectrum. This is a power spectral density for just two states. Now, imagine, obviously, there are not two states, they have uh, one defect, but there are a large number of defects which move around continuously in the solid. So in which case, the total noise will essentially be a sum of all the two state systems that you have in your solid. And you have got different Lorentzians, they're all moving at different time scales. Some is moving slowly, some is moving fast. So you've got different, um, different movements, speed of movements, and that leads to a total noise, which you can easily see, and this can be a homework problem if you wish. You take an integration of Lorentzian power spectrum with respect to frequency, or with respect to this time tau, where time tau is essentially the time scale of each, um, each, each relaxer or each defect, and then you take a integration of this, then you will see that you will get a one over F kind of a power spectrum in your uh, total noise of the system, okay? So this is one most common way of getting noise in a solid, okay? There are other ways, for example, if you have a, a, a silicon MOSFET, a transistor, for example, you have the channel in which the electron moves and the electron from this channel can go back and forth between the states or the deep disorder states in the silicon oxide barrier layer that you use in making the field effect transistor device, okay? And this can go from very quick uh, exchange to a very slow exchange and gives you exactly the same one over F noise because, you know, there are a large number of traps, the electron goes back and forth between the channel and the traps uh, continuously, uh, you know, as a function of time. So this gives you one over F noise as well. So now the question is, what can we do with it, right? Low frequency one over F noise. As I said, there are two aspects of it. One is the bane or what we do not like. For example, it limits the electronic device performance. Uh, it leads to phase noise in RF electronics. It also leads to uh, a studious limitation in the signal to noise ratio in sensors, detectors, there are optoelectronic detectors for astronomy, astro uh, uh, astrophysical purposes. Um, then sensing the Internet of Things, there are a large number of sensors. They're all limited by the existence of one over F noise. So we really need to do something to reduce them. 
And then something which is relatively non-trivial, and I'm going to give you an example for that, uh, is the defacing of uh, quantum devices. So today, quantum technology is becoming very, very big and uh, very promising. And tomorrow, if you want to have proper quantum de devices which retain phase coherence for a very long time, you need to reduce one over F noise, and I'll show you why in a, in a bit. But there are some good things as well, and that is the boon of one over F noise. And you can, I'm going to show you at least one example in which you can see detection of phase structural transitions. It's a beautiful probe for many body physics. It can look, look into or give you new phases, magnetic phases, where no other technique can give you, give you electronic phase transitions, mod transitions, superconducting transitions. There's a large number of different um, phenomena that noise can probe. So I'm going to give you a very quick example of why, uh, uh, you know, this is some. This talk is trying to motivate people about how uh, we can, uh, you know, why noise is an important quantity today. And I'll, let me tell you a little bit about dephasing in quantum devices. So you know, a quantum device is based on, say, for example, you want to make a qubit for a quantum computer, and that qubit exists in two states, zero and one. Okay, and this is a typical Hamiltonian of this. And when you try to make a real qubit, uh, one of the most important uh, workhorse of this is uh, aluminium, aluminium oxide, aluminium Josephson junctions. And this aluminium oxide, which is an amorphous oxide, which is grown as a tunnel barrier between two aluminium superconducting channels, it can contain defects. And those defects, there are two level systems in those defects. Okay. Those are usually cluster of atoms, deep, and, and you know, there are varied possibilities. It's still under research, but there are two level systems which can actually make transitions from one state to the other. When they do so, there is a problem because it, it couples to the qubit state, which is um, through phonon emission and through other mechanisms, and, and qubits essentially gets coupled to this disorder, and they because of uh, ignore this large Hamiltonian, but they lead to dephasing uh, uh, of the state of that, the, that the system is in. How? So suppose, for example, this is a Hamiltonian. It, you can imagine the qubit is at an effective magnetic field B. Okay, B is having two components. One is called a control field, because today, if you want to measure the qubit state, then you have to apply RF field, for example, and B naught is that control field. But then in, in addition to that, because then the qubit has coupled to some two level systems in the environment, there's a stochastic field that comes along with it. So the phase of the qubit evolves with the control and the stochastic part together. Okay, and that stochastic part can actually be shown is essentially the, the stochastic component of the effective magnetic field, which gives rise to the autocorrelation function. And if I look at exactly the same mechanism, the overall quantum information stored in the qubit decays with time with a time scale of capital T phi, where capital T phi is noise power spectral density at zero frequency. Now imagine if you have one over F noise in your system, then at zero frequency, one over F noise diverges. Of course, you cannot go to absolutely at zero frequency, but there is a very, very large component in the dephasing of the quantum information that comes because of the large noise present in the system due to at the low frequencies due to one over F noise. So as a result, what we need to do is find ways of reducing one over F noise in materials and systems and devices um, so that they can be used uh, as coherent system in quantum applications. Right, so I'm going to skip. So this is something which um, uh, we have been thinking about, about what kind of materials that are important for quantum technologies and where we must look at noise as, uh, as a source of disruption and we need to measure them and find ways to reduce them, okay? One of the examples is the two-dimensional materials. I'm going to give you a little bit of handle about how two-dimensional materials are important. Uh, for example, there are about 30, 35 two-dimensional materials, a little more maybe now, uh, which can be, which people have measured. Uh, graphene is one of them. 
the chalcogenides, transition between dichalcogenides, the layered semiconductors, like the topological insulators, these are all two dimensional materials because their out of plane layer to layer interaction is much weaker than the in plane interaction. And that is why you can exfoliate them mechanically and form individual layers. And you can have oxides as well. The high temperature superconductors are all, some of them are also, uh, or, uh, you know, two dimensional materials or layered materials per se. Um, so these two dimensional materials, I'm going to flip to very, very fast in the electronics, uh, novel superconductors, topological materials, uh, in, they can be used in quantum communication and photonics. They are used in quantum communications as, as single photon emitters and detectors. This is what we have been involved in as a separate piece of work. Uh, quantum computation, they, are, they can be bolometers, they can measure the state of a qubit by measuring the microwave radiation uh, quantum sensing, and there's a huge amount of applications that these two-dimensional materials are now uh, envisaged for. Um, they can be used, as, as I said, as emitters and volumeters in quantum technology directly uh, in today's, in today, uh, you know, in various devices. How we, we mechanically exfoliate this, this is something which uh, a simple video, you essentially mechanical exfoliation can be done in your laboratory. You take a chunk of graphite, for example, you use scotch tape, and then you essentially uh, press that material on top of the substrate, which is a silicon, silicon oxide substrate, and then you leave a layer on top. This is not controlled, but there are now many, many different ways in which such two dimensional materials can be created. Um, a generic graphene device is something like this. Um, yeah, you have a silicon silicon oxide wafer. Uh, what you do on top is that you, you take a scotch tape, you press the, the graphene exactly the way I showed you before, and then you put electrical contacts. And then uh, a typical device looks something like this. Okay. Uh, so if I ask why is the noise in graphene transistors? So in order to reduce noise, you have to know where the noise comes from. So um, if I look at the generic graphene device, then you can see that silicon oxide, which is an amorphous oxide on a doped silicon, which acts as a gate here. We apply a potential on this gate and you change the carrier density or concentration in the graphene layer. And that makes the resistance decrease on both sides of the gate voltage because on this side, you measure electron doping and on this side, you do hole doping. So larger as the electron holes and the electrons increase, the resistance goes down and that leads to a bell-shaped curve something like this. Now, if I do noise measurements of this, and let me show you how the noise behaves. So if I measure as a function of time, the resistance, you can see the resistance is maximum at this point, which is called the Dirac point. And the resistance is lowest as you go down, away more and more from the Dirac point and your heavily doped regime, the, the noise reduces uh, compared to the Dirac point. And this is how it typically looks. This is the noise magnitude, which is essentially the fluctuations, the variance of the fluctuations. And that goes down as you go up in doping on both electron side and the whole side. Okay, that's very good. So where the noise come from? The noise typically comes from fluctuations in the number of charge and mobility. For example, there are a lot of these traps of ox in the oxide that the graphene is sitting on, on this. So what happens is that if there is an electron which jumps out of graphene and goes into one of these traps, then it imparts a Coulomb potential back on the charge in the graphene layer. And not only the charge number changes, and that leads to change in resistance, but also the scattering changes, and that also leads to, uh, leads to additional noise. And there are models, McHotel model is one of them, uh, to calculate what is the noise magnitude as a function of electron density in the graphene layer. Um, but it strongly depends, as you can see here, it strongly depends on the number of such trap states inside the silicon oxide layer that the graphene is sitting on. Um, so it more or less fits well, the calculation as well as experimental observation, but it fails near the Dirac point and I'll show you how. And we have been looking at it. Uh, first question that we asked, okay, in order to reduce noise in graphene, how can we change the substrate? Okay, and this is something which we did a while ago, part of the graphene was kept on 
boron nitride, which is another two-dimensional material, but it, it gives you a very nice single crystal substrate as opposed to an amorphous substrate of silicon oxide. And you measure noise from this part as well as this part. And you can see that the noise when the system is sitting on boron nitride, which is this red part, is approximately 100 to, 10 to 100 times smaller than that part which is sitting on silicon oxide. So clearly, the noise from the substrate constitutes a substantial part of, of the noise uh, that you measure in, in, in graphene devices. Then we realize that, oh, hang on, there is more to that. And this is something which Paritosh did, and uh, he measured the noise in a van der Waals heterostructure of graphene in which the graphene was encapsulated in between two layers of boron nitride like this, and then he put a hall bar measurement. That means the noise, the current when it goes through graphene in this direction, the voltage leads do not overlap with the part of current, okay? So that essentially eliminates what you call contact noise because we realized that it is the, the metal graphene contact can lead to additional source of noise because the metal damages graphene locally and that leads to breakdown of screening and very large noise. So we found that when you do that, it's, it noise again comes down. So instead of, a, instead of a normal invasive probe geometry, if you use this kind of you know, non-invasive hall bar geometry, then the noise comes down okay? and it comes down by another order of magnitude. So then Saloni did something even more interesting and she said that, okay, let us try a different type of geometry and let us try to have a, a heterostructure where we will encapsulate graphene in beautiful environment of boron nitride, but we will also have a screening layer of, for example, a transition metal dichalcogenate. And then uh, the, the fluctuations from the environment can be completely uh, eliminated by this additional layer and whether that can lead to even lower noise in case of um, in, in, in graphene field effect transistor. So it turns out that that's very nice and she was absolutely right. Uh, I'll not go into the detail, but this noise level that you can see here in comparison to all other graphene based transistors is now one of the lowest, and it is the lowest that we can measure that, that we have in the world now, in which the molybdenum disulfide acts as a screening layer be, below the graphene layer and, and screens the external potential fluctuations that leads to the noise, okay? So if you're now asking me, okay, that's all very nice, so where we are with this? So let me just summarize it. So we now know the noise in two-dimensional devices can come from multiple sources. We have substrate traps and we have surface adsorbates. So whenever you make such devices, you have always some material sitting on top of the surface of the two-dimensional material, and that can lead to uh, additional noise and additional traps. Then we have got mobility of the uh, traps, which are uh, which can if the trap if the graphene is not mobile, it's not very uh, pure. Then you have additional noise. The band structures, uh, band, the band gap of graphene, uh, bilayer graphene, for example, can lead to additional noise. Um, you have got bulk and channel contact effects, crystallinity of the graphene grain boundary. These are all our work. Uh, crystallinity means if the grain boundary is in graphene, that leads to additional noise. And Parito shows a very nice metal graphene interface can also lead to additional noise. Okay. Um, how do you compare noise? There are several, not only inside graphene itself, there are so many possibilities, but also other than graphene, there are so many material systems. So how do you measure and compare noise? And that noise usually is compared through a parameter called Hooge parameter, gamma H, okay? This is SR, resistance power spectral density, divided by the mean resistance square, is usually proportional to this Hooge parameter, capital N is, um, the number of carriers in your in your solid in your uh, electrical conductor and frequency is f alpha is in the order of one. So now, if I compile the noise from all different devices, and this is something which uh, you know was there in this in this review, you can see the Hooge parameter is maximum here and minimum here, 
Um, these are different two-dimensional systems. If you take a silicon MOSFET, you have usually a very large noise. Uh, but this lower bars are that from graphene. Okay? Uh, silica, when we started originally, the single layer graphene, the noise level was about uh, a huge parameter of about 10 power of minus two, 10 power of minus one region. And as we uh, looked at different devices, started cleaning them up, started getting better, uh, better environment, we have now been able to, this is Saloni's uh, noise level of graphene, single layer graphene noise in 2020 has come down approximately by about three, three and a half orders of magnitude from 10 power minus one, minus two, to in the level of, um, indeed, the one among the lowest noise semiconducting device can now be made from single layer graphene, which is we are very excited by, because now we can use them in optoelectronic detection, we can use them as barometers and so on and so forth, and various device applications where we should be able to get proper response. Um, so this uh, also is something important, and I would now connect this with uh, something which is going to hopefully come up, um, that Saurav and Sakib, they all, uh, they looked at various types of uh, emerging quantum material, and then asked the fundamental question that is the noise magnitude connected to the defacing link or electrons phase coherence link in such solids. And it turns out, this is a very interesting compilation. I thought of showing it to you. This is, there's a large number of different materials and you can see if the huge parameter, if the noise parameter is large, then usually the phase breaking coherence, phase breaking length is short. That means the quantum coherence in the, in the system is usually short and uh, it's kind of reflects the dephasing by structural defect, by, by various kinds of two level systems in, 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 in these, materials. So if you want to get high phase breaking length, long phase breaking length, and long phase breaking lengths are required for quantum applications because the electron retains its phase memory, then the huge parameter must go down significantly. Okay. So this is something which is quite exciting uh, to look at overall uh, understanding of, of uh, you know, quantum materials. Right. So I have more or less told you where I am in the, in the why we should reduce noise. I would like to give you examples of what you can do uh, with the noise as a resource. Um, I'm guessing I have about 15 minutes or so. Is that true? Uh, that is know, right. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, absolutely. Right. Good. Yeah. Good, excellent. So I would say about what is noise as a resource, right? I mean, how can you use? And this is something we have been involved in for, um, for quite a long time, right from the beginning of my group here. Uh, and, and we always ask questions where noise can be used. I'm going to, this is going to be a busy slide, but I'll give you a, that should give you a flavor of how diverse the application of noise can be. For example, Chadni started her heart PhD by looking at, uh, by looking at the phase, structural phase transitions in, uh, in, in shape memory alloys and asked the question, whether the thermal nature of phase transition can lead to, lead to low frequency noise. And we found something uh, very interesting there. You can then Vidya and Atin, they looked at the hybridization of valleys in graphene using noise and looked at and found that noise carries unique signatures of when the valleys in graphene of K and K prime are connected through scattering disorder uh, and when they're not. Right? And this is very important if you want to use graphene for various kinds of applications of, um, you know, like circular, uh, like, like, which is, which requires valetronics, for example. Uh, we looked at superconductivity, uh, vortex interactions with Pratap in TIFR, and looked at uh, when superconductors are reduced to extremely thin uh, level, and it's a two-dimensional transition that from superconductor to normal state, the costly thalus space transition, you can use noise to actually look at the vortex interactions in a disordered ultra thin superconductor. Uh, you can go to graphene, look at, look at fundamental uh, many body states with noise. For example, we looked, Paritosh found out that, that if you have got defects or individual defects in very close to a high mobility graphene channel, then that leads to two level systems in which the graphene channel and the defect forms a many body state in what you call a Fermi singularity. 
And this is something which is uh, looked at in various, even looked, uh, seen in, uh, in, in, in uh, silicon MOSFETs as well. Um, then Ahmed saw uh, bilayer graphene topological effects, for example, he found that you can use noise to look at um, strongly insulating bilayer graphene has got topological edge channels going around the corner. And that could be found out, the, the, those could not be seen in conventional measurements, but we are versus T, but using, using one over F noise, uh, using conductance fluctuations, he could actually identify the topological effects in bilayer graphene. Um, we saw magnetic effects, and this is something which I would like to talk about a little bit today uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, in which you can see that time reversal symmetry and magnetic state uh, can be probed using one over F noise in a diverse class of systems. And I'm going to give you two examples of uh, semiconducting, uh, two-dimensional semiconductors, as well as uh, grain boundaries of graphene. And from there, we are now asking questions about um, you know, whether the Mott transitions in oxide, and Shai is doing this work uh, with, um, you know, when critical slowing down of electrons can happen or not. So this is our ongoing work. And these are the diversity of the questions that you can address if you have that eight lakh setup in your laboratory. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of understanding about what happens in this, and that will be my last topic. So this happened uh, in collaboration. Uh, our correlated two dimensions, two correlated state in 2D doped semiconductors happened in collaboration with uh, Michelle Simmons in the Sydney University because they have this fantastic ability to grow 2D um, semiconductor, 2D doped semiconductors. I'll give you a picture. Uh, it's like this. So you have a bulk silicon in which the or silicon or germanium in which the phosphorus atomic dopants are doped only in a layer and not bulk doped. So bulk doped semiconductors have been here for a very long time in 1970s, 80s, or even earlier, actually 1943 was the first paper. Um, but this is different. This is different because now there is a technology through which uh, the dopants can be put in one layer and this gives you a two dimensional semiconductor in some form. And the question that, and you, what we did, we measured noise in that, and you can see typical noise in those are extremely low because they are very well um, stabilized and noise level of two nanovolt really. And it's one of the lowest noise two dimensional system that we have ever measured. The question we asked is that can the correlated states emerge when the doping concentration is reduced across the metallicylical transition, which means when I start, changing the concentration of this red colored dopants so of phosphorus, the system at some point of time becomes metal at high doping concentration, goes to insulating side at low doping concentration, and whether there are correlated states or, maybe, or something interesting in that uh, situation. Uh, so that was the question we asked with dope silicon. Um, and the similar, the reason I clubbed them together is that their experimental signature were very similar. The completely different field, we asked another question, and this was Kimberly Vidya asked the question whether uh, if I take a grain boundary in graphene, and grain boundaries are always having very large different types of defect, which is not always our control, can the grain boundary become magnetic at some point? And the difficulty in such measurements is because grain boundary is an extremely narrow region in space. And there are very few magnetic moments and that it is very difficult to look at the grain boundary using conventional magnetic measurements. And that becomes even more difficult if your sample is cooled below when the magnetism develops at very low temperature. So there are no very satisfactory magnetic probing. So the question is whether can we use electrical transport and noise in looking for possible frozen magnetic order in, in graphene grain boundaries. Um, what, the, the, the question that came because of several several um, computational work and in which you know there are certain types of grain boundaries called the translational grain boundaries there are other kinds of grain boundaries as well which shows the extremely large density of states at the Fermi energy and that can lead to a possible stoner magnetism and other possible magnetism magnetic order okay so this is a question can magnetism emerge at individual grain boundaries in graphene? And this was uh, what the work was of uh, 
Vidya and then Kimberley. And they looked at this, this large regions uh, are graphene grains, which were created by what you call an interrupted chemical vapor deposition in which uh, we have um, uh, two grains of graphene essentially coalesced in this region and a grain boundary is formed here. And you can see the grain boundary can be extremely narrow. This is about two nanometers, a few nanometers in, in, in width. And this is where the challenge in actual magnetic probing can come into play. However, our ability to make devices is that we could arrest the grain boundary in an electrical device. This is essentially this uh, grain boundary in, in, in these regions. And then you can measure the noise in both the, in, across the grain boundary, as well as a region which doesn't have a grain boundary and see if they're different. And from there you infer whether there is any magnetic uh, order or not. Okay, so the, this is called a G grain boundary region. This is a single grain region. But before I go into a couple of experimental slides, let me tell you the physical principle why we believe noise can be a very good probe for magnetic interaction. So that comes from the concept of what we call universal conductance fluctuations. Now, if I take a solid like this and I pass current from one end to the other, the electrons essentially go in random paths, diffusion. Electron diffuses from one end of the circle to the other end, right? And there are multiple paths. Now, what happens is, that if I take a cross correlation of two paths, because remember, noise is a cross correlation of, of two um, Feynman paths, and, and that leads to <clears throat> two possibilities or two contributions uh, of noise. So, for example, this is one path, this, and this is another path, and these two paths interfere, and this interference can lead to two possibilities. One, <coughs> excuse me, one, the two paths move in the same direction across this region, or the two paths can move in the opposite direction in the same region. So this is only two possibilities. The two interfering paths, if I take a region and they diffuse across it, they can either move in the same direction or they can move in the opposite direction. Okay? So that means that if I apply now a magnetic field here, then the path in which they are moving in opposite direction, they accumulate random phases in the sample and they get averaged out. So there are two possibilities out of which one possibility vanishes. So what happens because of that, the total noise in the system comes down by exactly by a factor of two. So UCF is reduced exactly by a factor of two when the time reversal symmetry, there's a spelling mistake, the time reversal symmetry is removed. And this is called time reversal symmetry, right? Because um, uh, we are removing the phase, uh, we are adding random phase so that the path which is going forward and the path which is coming back have now accumulated different phase. Okay. Now this exactly, uh, uh, exact reduction of noise by a factor of two is our experimental probe. And not only when applied magnetic field, but also there is magnetic structure or magnetic uh, magnetism present in this field, in the system, we will have this part removed spontaneously. I'm going to flip to this. Um, so this has been used. This has been used by early uh, measurements in magnetic wires, for example. This was Dr. Nuttelson's work in 2004. You can see if I take, if I take a gold palladium non-magnetic wire, if I apply a magnetic field, which is larger than the phase breaking magnetic field, noise comes down by a factor of two. So from here, it comes down here. However, if I take a permalloy wire, which is a magnetic system, you can see even if I apply a magnetic field, the noise does not change because the time reversal symmetry in a magnetic system is spontaneously removed even at zero magnetic field and hence applying a small magnetic field does not make any difference. So we use this concept to look at um, the magnetism in graphene grain boundaries. So here is a typical graphene grain boundary R versus resistance versus gate voltage. You can see exactly the same as the graphene grain uh, transfer characteristic that I showed you earlier, the large noise in the Dirac region and as you increase the gate voltage, the noise comes down. 
And our experimental probe is the variance of noise. So if I take the delta R by R and I take the variance of these fluctuations, then this is the this n is the noise, which is the integrated fluctuations over a certain time t is our is our experimental probe. Okay. Now what happens within the grain? Suppose I don't have a, I have a grain boundary, but I measure away from the grain boundary, and I measure at a at a uh, gate voltage, say for example, at two gate voltage, I can measure at high gate voltage in the whole side and a high gate voltage at the at the um, electron side. You can see that the noise, which is in this region, comes down exactly by a factor of two when I apply a magnetic field because magnetic field is removing the time reversal symmetry and the noise is coming down because the Couperon contribution is removed and it is exactly by a factor of two reduction. And whether you are here or here or here, it doesn't matter. Noise comes down by a factor of two always, which means that the, within the single grain region, the time reversal symmetry is maintained at all temperatures and at all gate voltages. However, if I do this at a grain boundary, now you can see there's a grain boundary here and I'm measuring the noise across the grain boundary. And I'm going to show you two different gate voltages. One is at the Dirac point. You can see at the Dirac point, noise is coming down by a factor of two. But if I go here, somewhere here, then you can see noise is no longer coming down by a factor of two, but it is just about 1.5 to lower. And this data was taken at 4.5 Kelvin. If I do the same experiment at uh, 0.3 Kelvin, a lower temperature, you can see that at the Dirac point, noise comes down by a factor of two, but when I go to large densities, the noise no longer comes down by a factor of two, which means that the spontaneous removal of time reversal symmetry and possible emergence of magnetic order, that is not only at low temperature, but also at high density. So that gives us a possibility of looking at magnetism that is driven by electric field. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have looked at it, at, uh, you know, um, and we believe that this is possibly a magnetic order at the grain boundary, prob probably forms a spin glass phase. And because the noise increases rapidly at lower temperature below one Kelvin or two Kelvin, and, and possibly leads to a glassy behavior uh, in this, in graphene. Uh, when they're disordered. So that's quite interesting, it's still uh, under process. Right, now we saw a very similar example in, in, uh, in delta doped silicon, okay? And when we go in, in when, I change the, when I change the density of dopants, as you go down in density, the, the conductivity starts decreasing. And at certain point here, there is a metal to insulator transition. So this side is metallic side, this side is insulating side. And we wanted to essentially measure as a function of this doping, uh, what is the noise, how does noise behave in this kind of two-dimensional magnetic, two-dimensional semiconductors. Remember silicon, phosphorus, and there's nothing else. They are all non-magnetic system, right? Then we realized that this is something which we should, this is where we should measure the noise. And if I measure noise at sufficiently high um, density where the interaction is low, what happens is the noise reduces by twice. As you can see, the noise reduces as you increase the magnetic field, noise decreases exactly by a factor of two. As I showed you, uh, removal of couperons, and then there is another factor of two reduction because of the Zeeman splitting. But this is where both couperon in this sample, when interaction magnitude is very small, it gives you both contribution from Couperon and diffusions, hence the noise is factor of two higher. But if I go at a strong interaction regime, then the noise is missing the first reduction. That means even if I apply a magnetic field, there is no factor of two reduction, very similar to what you see in the onset of magnetism. It shows that at very strong interaction, so random doped two-dimensional semiconductor probably becomes magnetic themselves. And this is something uh, we saw earlier as well, as you can increase the magnetic interaction, you can see there is no factor of two reduction. And that is, uh, you know, is indicative of the fact that our emergent uh, 
removal of time reversal symmetry or frozen magnetism. Right. So this is something which uh, was also, uh, you know, interesting from Saqib's uh, work in his thesis. I would like to summarize. So it looks like the noise, what I wanted to tell you is the noise is a powerful tool for both uh, device characterization and fundamental questions. I guess uh, the noise that I um, focused on today is one over F noise. Uh, what I could not cover today is uh, Johnson noise and shot noise. And these are as important, I would say, as the flicker noise. You can see such a large field. You can take one over F noise and ask so many different diverse type of questions. You can ask similar questions with shot noise, with, and it can ask you can ask about effective electronic charge because shot noise is directly proportional to the effective charge of the quasi particles, and you can ask questions whether this is quantum Hall regime. You can ask what is the effective charge in normal superconductor junctions, and uh, you know chaotic kinetics of electron. Johnson noise is becoming extremely important for many body phases through thermoelectricity, bolometry, electron thermometry. Uh, I could not convert, uh, uh, say much about this, although we have started um, this kind of work now. Uh, I would like to thank my, uh, end this talk with uh, uh, thanking my collaborators over the many, many years uh, from diverse institutions and uh, our own institution. But most difficult thing is to uh, thank all the students. Um, I put in, most of the photographs of the students and their postdocs, I would ask them to find them out themselves, but it's going to be difficult. Um, in my group, uh, you know, uh, there is a series of generations of students in the last 10, 15 years uh, who have contributed to all the work uh, that I have presented. Uh, we gen generally try to, you know, mix, uh, mix pleasure and work um, and uh, uh, all the, work in terms of devices, measurements, are all due to uh, their motivation and hard work. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm sure that all of you agree that this is a wonderful lecture by Professor Haridab Ghosh, who could measure the noise to the highest precision level, of course, without making any noise. He's handling so many instruments, but you don't see any noise, but he can measure the noises to a great precision. So he can really control, he can tune, he can monitor. So either it is for device physics, for make, well, making the devices, he wants to reduce the noise to the lowest level. I still remember that one of the highest photo uh, responsibility photo detector he has reported with a graphene TMD heterojunction. That is probably still a record. And I don't know whether you'll be able to measure a single photon in the near future with those kind of devices. On the other hand, he has used the uh, so-called the he used the noise as the resource to get a physical insights in a lot of phenomena, which are actually very, very difficult to measure otherwise using a conventional system, be it superconductor, be it a, be it a, a quantum device, be it a single qubit, and there are many, many more. So I think this is a very wonderful lecture to motivate our uh, young students and uh, particularly those young faculty members who are trying to think, take the research as a career. And he has shown that uh, if you do a little bit of uh, innovation in your lab, that even without using much uh, capital equipment, you can still make a lot of <clears throat> fundamental measurements, which can be useful for your uh, lot of physics problems. So I'm sure that there will be a lot of questions. So we'll be very happy to take questions. So in the beginning, I think we'll take the questions for the, from the uh, uh, people who have joined live. And then there are a lot of students probably joined uh, through the YouTube. So I'm sure uh, Dr. Sujitana Chatterjee, somebody will be uh, reading the questions for, no, so let us have the direct questions to Dr. Arindam Ghosh speaker. Anyone from the audience who are connected to the Zoom? Okay, may, maybe let me start with uh, just one question probably uh, to Arindam. Of course, I hear to a lot of your lectures and you always come with some new results, so I, uh, really forget that which one was the latest one. So the in one of the papers that is one one of the curves that you have shown that when you start measuring the noise is still uh, particularly for the quantum device or quantum qubit device, still the gallium arsenate aluminum gallium arsenate works much better compared to 2Ds and other kind of materials. 
so is it due to uh, kind of crystalline quality or this is due to the less mobility i mean less mobility fluctuations rather so what could be the reason for that it's usually because of uh, because of crystallinity so mm -hmm. we actually found that the gall gallium arsenide still is noisy because it has got this uh, dopants are randomly distributed in the um, modulation layer which is a little bit away from the actual uh, two dimensional electron gas but actually, we found that the lowest noise is in the phosphorus doped silicon uh, devices, where the, because phosphorus is strongly bound, and we found the noise is extremely weak. Uh, the electrons are the pro, and, and we realized that the, in order to decrease noise in silicon or any semiconductor, crystalline environment is the key. Yeah, that's and, what, yeah, right, right. Yeah. yeah. So, so please continue. I mean, no. So, uh, if the if you've got a perfectly crystalline crystalline in, uh, system, mm -hmm. the only noise that can come from is from the environment. Mm -hmm. So, if you have first you clean up the crystallinity of the sample and then you screen it from the environment, and that gives you the lowest noise device that you can make. Yeah, so in the phosphorus of silicon, I know that group, that Australian group actually, who has already demonstrated qubits. So yeah. what is the optimum uh, final doping label? Are they correlated with no your noise measurements? Right, so the noise, is, the noise we measured was in two-dimensionally doped um, semiconductors, mm -hmm. whereas the actual qubits were made by, by making for individual phosphorus or cluster of phosphorus atoms okay. at specific positions. And then they were they acted as quantum dots. Right. So we actually measured noise in those systems as well, and they are uh, among the lowest noise system that we have ever measured, and which is reflected in their extremely high coherence times. Actually, the charge noise, mm -hmm. which is the most important dephasing mechanism mm -hmm. in quantum devices, mm -hmm. is extremely weak because the quantum dots or the phosphorus atoms are embedded in a single crystalline atmosphere below the surface from the in the, in the in a single crystal silicon, so which is why the dephasing time in those are in the order of five hundred milliseconds, for example, which is extremely long. Okay, great. So yeah. So any other uh, questions, particularly for the people who have joined online? Okay, okay. I have a very small question. Please go ahead, uh, Professor. Uh, this is a very exciting lecture. Thank you very much. So uh, in case of contact noise, yeah. is there any role of uh, metal type when contact metal or functional group present in the graphene. Yeah. So graphene itself doesn't have a functional group present when you make them. At least we, we believe that we have, we make sufficiently pristine quality graphene. Okay. Uh, what happens is when you try to deposit metals for contacts, it fizzes out because we usually use a wetting layer. So that is, for example, a titanium or chromium, etc. And that leads to a reaction of the, or, or some form of a um, bond formation between the metal atoms and the graphene. Okay. Okay. So that changes the electronic structure locally. And hence the pristine property of graphene are destroyed in those regions. And hence noise comes through, the, through those regions, which is why the contact noise is larger when we use this con use this uh, rating metals, but if I remove those metals and do not uh, use them, then the contact noise goes down. But the problem is contact resistance goes up. So one of the very interesting aspect of graphene is that the contact resistance and contact noise are two different are controlled through two different means mm -hmm. altogether. Right. Thank you. Any other question from the live session? Otherwise, I have to go to YouTube <coughs> questions. So I think uh, we have a couple of questions yes. that are typed in the chat box. Right. Do you want to so, read them, Professor Roy? Yeah. Uh, yes, I can, or you can also. Okay, I can. Okay, read I them. can. Okay, I can read the oh, questions. Sorry, uh, please, uh, Sujitana, please go ahead. Why don't Thank you, you so much. Yeah, yeah right. that's fine. Right. So we have a question from Shamrat Roy, who is one of our MSc students. Uh, thank you for the nice talk, sir. Can we infer anything? about Berry's phase and quantization in topological insulators using the measurement of noise? Right, this is a very nice question. In fact, we did work on topological uh, materials um, using noise. 
Um, so usually the Berry's phase is reflected uh, in quantum transport, where you look at what we call an anti-localization uh, at low magnetic fields. So the resistance increases uh, instead of decreasing in, in, a, in, a, in a system with the Berry's phase. Um, as far as noise is concerned in these materials, if I uh, remember properly, um, the Berry's phase is not directly uh, connected to the noise magnitude, uh, but it is connected to uh, the, you know, how the electrons are in the, in the surface layer in topological insulators are screened by, from, the, from the charge centers in the bulk. Um, so it's, there is, if I understand, the 1 over F noise is not connected, but universal conductance fluctuations probably will be connected. So um, I need to check it, take a look at that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Professor Ghosh. So we have another question from, again, one of our MSc students, Moitra Kundu. So Moitra asks, can you explain how the noise variation points to the breaking of Time reversal symmetry, I didn't understand it fully. So the slide okay. where you discussed time reversal, breaking sure. of time reversal symmetry. Sure, sure. I can, I can, I can probably go to the slide. It's a minute. Uh, it takes half a minute. So, uh, you know, there are um, any kind of disordered system where electrons moves in a diffusive manner from one end of the sample to the other. There are two independent contributions to noise. Okay. So in one, you have uh, any region in space. Remember, if you have a disordered system, the, the electrons are going with, uh, in diffusive paths and which you can tentatively call them as Feynman paths as well. So noise is a co cross correlation between these two paths. So I, I've drawn these two paths here. Now imagine there are these regions where the two paths intersect and interfere. Okay? That, that leads to interference effect in and that leads to the same, same idea leads to weak localization as well. But I'm going to go one step beyond weak localization. This is called universal conductance fluctuations. So we have to consider two parts. So imagine this situation where they two, these two parts interfere by crossing each other, okay? Now, when they cross each other, you will have two different ways of crossing. It can, you, you can, once you come here, you can either go like this or you can go like this and goes this way. So any kind of crossing of two paths can make two, two directionalities of motion possible, either in the same sense or in the opposite sense, okay? Now, if you have no magnetic field, then you take these two paths and the phase accumulated from going from here to there is identical when it comes back like this. That's called time reversal symmetry. Okay, so the phase accumulated in going from one from left to right is identical when it goes from right to left. Now that breaks down when I apply a magnetic field. When I apply a magnetic field, and you can do this yourself, it's very easy. You take a vector potential and take an integral. The phi, the phase accumulated is an integral of vector potential with a small length uh, element and integrate from one point to the other, right? That is the phase accumulated. But when I have a magnetic field, the phase accumulated from this while going from here to left to right is unequal from while going from left right to left. So this is what is called breakdown of time reversal symmetry. I hope that makes it clear. Write yeah. to me if you need more, uh, if you have more questions. Thank you very much, Professor Ghosh. So if there are other questions, People can unmute themselves and ask the questions also or type it in the chat box and we can read it out. Uh, so Chatterjee, there are a few more questions in the chat box I can see. Uh, I think there's only one from a YouTube, the question that is being copied from a YouTube uh, viewer. So we can yes. take that question probably. Yeah, so it's, I, by, it's by, by Mukesh Kumar. Yeah, from the YouTube here. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, Mukesh. Yeah, that's Yeah. Does top electrode deposition technique have any role in noise? Um, I don't know what top electrode is. I think I'm guessing the top electrode deposition technique. Top electrode would um, probably of gate. I'm guessing electrodes, we are usually, usually uh, mean gate uh, on the top. Um, 
as long as the since the gate doesn't have a direct a direct coupling to the channel in which the electrons flow it usually doesn't affect the noise as to my understanding although the screening can occur so that can indirectly affect the noise magnitude in channels it's because now when you have a metal uh, very close proximity to the current carrying channel it can screen the potential fluctuations nearby and that can reduce the noise slightly. Okay, thank you. So, Professor Rai, there's another question from a YouTube user. Yeah, please go Na ahead. Yeah, yeah Narayana Karkeda. So, the, 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 user, the viewer asks, at IIC, do you plan designing chips based on graphene? I think, yeah, this is a good question. In the engineering department, there are efforts and uh, propositions that to make devices, uh, chips of large number of uh, uh, graphene transistors on a wafer scale. Um, it's um, now this is a major uh, direction. There have been road electronics roadmaps, and various companies have uh, started making graphene based field effect device at a wafer scale. Uh, so, yes, in IFC also, there are efforts, not in my lab, but I know there are efforts uh, in engineering departments to make graphene based chips. Thank you. So, any other questions? from people who are in the Zoom session or the, uh, or the YouTube people who are watching over at YouTube. You can also unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, if not, can I just ask one quick question? Yeah, please go ahead. Right. Uh, thank you, Professor Rai. So, uh, Professor Ghosh, this was a wonderful talk. And actually, in our MSc lab, we have an experiment which is fundamentals of noise, so noise characterization. Although, yeah, since we could not do the lab for a long time, so right. it's not something that we could do because we couldn't go to do offline labs. And this is a fantastic talk, particularly for someone like me, because in astrophysics, we worry all the time about right. you know, noise. Well, it's not noise in our language. It's like systematic effects and something yeah. like that. So this is a very beautiful. So I, my question is, is, this is actually related to that a few years back when we had that uh, uh, discussion about, you know, room temperature superconductivity. And I thought that noise had a very big role to play in sort of understanding the signal. Can you a uh, little bit tell us about it? What's the status of it? Yeah. Right. So, I mean, to my understanding, the noise that was reported in uh, the context of superconductivity there was a systematic noise. It's not random noise. So we cannot uh, attribute that with the kind of phenomenological uh, or phenomena that I that I described today. Um, generally, what happens is, uh, although you know uh, the universal conductance fluctuations and similar kind of phenomena have a certain reproducibility but they also have randomness. For example, if I take magnetic field, which was the case in that measurement as well, you take magnetic field and vary the magnetic field, you see resistance going up and down, but in a reproducible manner in which you come back and you, you go uh, again, change the magnetic field, you see exactly you know, the same states of resistance. Um, but they are sufficiently random from one, uh, you know, so, so if I change the temperature or if I change uh, some other parameter, that aperiodicity or uh, reproducibility becomes different. Okay. So for example, if you take, if you take uh, a sample at temperature T1 and then I vary the magnetic field, I will see that, uh, a reproducible state of oscillations. But if I change the temperature to T2 and I do the measurement again as a function of magnetic field, I will see another set of reproducible oscillations which may not be same as the previous set. Now, if you look at those kind of noise in, in that paper, that's not the case. So it was more of a noise from more systematic origin, which at least I do not understand where it comes from. Uh, but I don't think at this point of time, that there is a fundamental uh, 
phenomenon associated with it. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Professor Roy. Yeah. And so if there are no more questions, so it is time to thank uh, Professor Idnam Ghosh for his wonderful lecture, being the fascinating physics from simple measurements. So of course we have to give you thank only virtually in this case. Thank you. And I'm really thankful to the, uh, the Presence University and IPA for giving me this responsibility to chair the session. I mean, this is a wonderful way to reach the, the undergraduate physics students or the postgraduate physics students, particularly at this pandemic. And you got a wonderful speaker. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I answer now? I think, uh, yes, you can answer. Yes. Deepsha, please. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's my. Jagada, I'll see you later sometime. Uh, sure, sure. Can we leave now? Yes. Thanks a lot. It was a very nice. Uh... Uh, yeah, Vandana. Thank you, Vandana. Yeah, yeah, very, very nice talk. Yeah. Thank so you. I think. Okay. So Deepsha, you want to, yeah, maybe just quickly. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. thank you, Professor Arindam Ghosh for the illuminating talk. Uh, I will request Dr. Shetana Chatterjee to say a few words about the session. Okay, thank you very much, Deepsha. Just, uh, I just want to thank the people. So first of all, uh, who were responsible for having such a fascinating session today, very quickly. So first of all, of course, IPA, uh, Indian Physics Association for having this wonderful series and uh, they thought of, uh, you know, collaborating with Presidents University. So thanks to uh, Professor Vandana Nanal, who, who was uh, the mastermind behind this. Professor Tarusi Shahadash Gupta, uh, the Vice President, as well as the Director of SNB and CBS for her representation from the IP and being with us all the time. Professor Shomit Roy for chairing the session. And I must just say that uh, uh, for the last few years, we have gotten so much help from SNB and CBS in so many matters. Uh, Professor Rai, uh, there were many, there were a couple of uh, events we actually co-organized with SNB and CBS. So that gives me really pleasure to tell that here. And of course, this was a fantastic talk from Professor Arindam Ghosh. I never get to meet you in person. We met virtually, yeah. we corresponded over email. I yeah. uh, really thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you for coming. And probably we'll have some physical talk at presidency sometimes. I hope and, so too. Yeah. yeah. And many thanks to my colleagues, uh, Professor Aurobindo Nayak and Dr. Otun Rajuk for being with me and you know sharing their wis wisdom in certain things. And of course, last but not the least, our students, Shubhra Jyoti, who made the beautiful poster, Moitro, who was responsible for registration, Dipsha and Devanit, who actually, you know, moderated the questions and everything, and all the other uh, students who are a little bit involved in certain process. This is not a big organization because it's online. But I guess as uh, Professor Go showed a picture full of students, and uh, we as professors, we always get happy when we get to even say a little bit about the kind of work that our students do, not even just in physics, but not science, but even. So we, we really feel pride to, you know, inspire our students uh, so that, you know, I guess, I guess that's one of the role that we play as mentors. So thank you students, thank you for enthusiasm. And again, thanks to everyone involved for making this a success, okay? Thank you. And I okay. guess now we can uh, probably end the session. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Shijatana. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Arindam, see you later. See you later. Bye. <laughs> okay.